Good morning, and thank you for joining me on this beautiful Thursday morning. Uh, I'm Peter Calcara, Vice President of Government Relations. Uh, thank you um, again for joining me for the next uh, 50 minutes or so as uh, we try to unwrap um, some of uh, the legislative activity um, that's happening here in Harrisburg, the building uh, across from me. This is our first legislative update uh, of the year of 2021. I need to make sure I get my years right. Um, first legislative update of the of 2021 and also uh, first update of the new uh, on the new uh, General Assembly, the 205th General Assembly, which uh, was sworn in in January. Um, as with the start of any new legislative session, there is kind of a, a delay process. Um, you know, uh, committees are are now organized. There was a, a, a time in January and, and February where the committees weren't even organized, but committees are now organized. Uh, they're up and running. Rules adopted. Um, and legislation is being considered, but there's still a little bit of a, a drag in, in, the, in the legislative process. We'll, we'll talk about that. There's uh, a little bit of a delay in bills getting introduced uh, and, and, and moving through the process uh, simply because it's a new year and, and um, you know, a lot of bills are still being in, in, in the draft format, are still being drafted. Uh, we do have a budget, though, for the proposed budget for the 21-22 uh, fiscal year. Uh, proposed by Governor Wolf, his, his seventh. We'll talk certainly talk a lot about that. Committees, the appropriations committees have been fairly active. The House Appropriations Committee just completed three weeks of budget hearings on the governor's uh, budget proposal. The Senate Appropriations Committee um, took up the budget this week, uh, kind of, the, they delayed, um, they delayed the process simply because they wanted to see if Congress was going to do anything, uh, anything more with regard to, to stimulus and which obviously now we know that they have. Um, so just a real quick look at our agenda for the morning for the next 50 minutes or so. Talk about, um, really talk about the budget, um, the focus really in on the 21-22 proposed budget simply because that's uh, that's that's really the, the, the main item that's, that's out there right now that's for consideration. I'd like to start though this morning by talking a little bit about what I call the playing field, uh, the, 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 the General Assembly, 205th General Assembly was sworn in in early January. Um, you can see there the numbers Republicans control. And again, I talk, this is the playing field. This is the, this is the field of play that we have to go in and, you know, talk to legislators to get our, our, our legislation through the process. So this is really the, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, the field of play that uh, we're, we're, we're dealing with every day. Um, as you can see, there are two, there are three vacancies, one in the uh, state house and two in the state senate. Tragically, Representative Mike Reese uh, from Westmoreland County passed away uh, January 1st from a brain aneurysm. And I think a week later, Senator Dave Arnold from uh, Lebanon County passed away from uh, brain cancer. Two very young uh, and, and pretty dynamic legislators. Uh, Reese was in the House Republican leadership and really was a star of that caucus, a huge, huge loss. And just recently, Senator John Blake announced that he was stepping down and I think stepped down this week uh, to take a position with uh, his congressman in, in the Northeast Pennsylvania. Uh, also critical to to the playing field, if you will, are, are what I call what we call our CPA caucus, um, who are are incredibly valuable. And I know a lot of you have uh, who have sat in on my webinars before hear you know, hear me mention them. But I think it's critical that we acknowledge them and who they are because they do an awful lot for the profession of PICPA. I just met, mentioned them real quickly in order of seniority. Uh, Representative Mike Pfeiffer, Representative George Dunbar, Representative Keith Greiner, Representative uh, um, Frank Ryan, Representative Ben Sanchez, and Representative Freshman Representative Nick Piscatano from Western Pennsylvania. That's a, a makeup of four uh, Republicans and two Democrats. Um, the, the only member of the Senate uh, who's a CPA is Senator Pat Brown, uh, who is uh, chairman of the Appropriations Committee. You can see there, though, that Republicans have pretty significant majorities in, in both chambers. Um, there will be special elections to fill um, the, the, all three of the seats. I, I know the two of the seats, the Reese and Arnold seats, will be filled in special elections May 18th. I'm not sure if the Blake replacement has or election has been announced yet, the, when that will be announced. 
a corner of the playing field that we have to deal with a lot is uh, are the finance committees uh, and real quickly just to um, share with you some of the members are the members of both the house and the senate finance committee um, representative mike pfeiffer as i just mentioned um, is uh, an inactive CPA, but uh, he had, a, had a, uh, his own firm uh, for a number of years. His colleague, his Democratic chair, is Kevin Boyle, who's new to the committee. He is from the Pittsburgh area. Uh, last session, he chaired the House State Government Committee. Uh, he's also brothers, uh, a brother of Congressman Brendan Boyle. Uh, here you can see the, the profession is, is represented on the House Finance Committee from the Republican side. Representative Keith Griner from Lancaster and Frank Ryan, again, are, are both members of uh, both members of the Finance Committee and in, incredibly helpful. On the Democratic side, uh, several new members, uh, new faces uh, on this committee, uh, members that uh, we're going to have to reach out to and, and, and certainly uh, get to know a little bit better. But uh, uh, a couple of holdovers, Mike Driscoll, uh, uh, Representative Dave Valesio, and Joe Webster uh, are, are all valuable, valuable members and uh, people that we certainly, PICPA works with uh, regularly. On the Republic, on the Senate side, um, uh, Scott Hutchinson is the Republican uh, Majority Chairman of the committee. John Blake, uh, we, we show here, who's obviously has uh, resigned his seat now, um, and uh, I um, as of last evening or yesterday, a replacement for his, his position as chair of the, uh, the finance, minority chair of the finance committee has not been announced yet. And again, our sole CPA legislator, Pat Brown, not only chairs finance, I mean, not only chairs the appropriations committee, but is an uh, incredibly valuable member of the finance committee. Uh, very helpful to have his, his voice and, and all the members on, the, uh, on, on this committee and uh, the Democratic members of the, of the Senate Finance Committee. And, and just want to share with you, uh, again, that, um, that committee, both of those committees, because they're a committee, a committee that we obviously deal a lot with and very actively involved in. And I'll mention, talk a little bit later about a testimony that PICP provided to a subcommittee of the House Finance Committee earlier this week. Now, uh, moving on. Uh, want to talk just briefly about the fiscal outlook of the Commonwealth because it's uh, quite frankly it's not not a lot of good news um, the independent fiscal office who does amazing they do amazing work put out their five-year economic and budget outlook in early January and it wasn't really a, a very very pretty picture long-term uh, structural deficit through the next five years uh, where it uh, peaks at $2.6 billion in the 2023 year and as you can see there one of the big issues one of the, the big issues is using this one-time revenue source, one-time um, funding sources to uh, fund budget items. Uh, it's a practice that's been used for years. But um, not only that, but we also in the 2023 budget cycle, the Commonwealth has a, a, a cliff, so to speak, on the public transportation funding. And that's a 450 to $500 million hole that we know, that the General Assembly knows they have to fix. On, I guess on the good news is IFO projects, uh, uh, IFO's projections um, assume no recession, low interest, and moderate inflation, inflation which is good. Uh, revenues for the year for the current 2021 fiscal year have been uh, doing quite well, actually. Um, as of the end of February, revenues, according to the Department of Revenue, are ahead of projection or ahead of estimates by about $900 million. IFO has IFO has projected a little bit less, uh, or IFO's uh, projections are a little bit less, but overall for the fiscal year, IFO's outlook, independent fiscal office outlook is, is much more, for, for the current fiscal year, is much more positive uh, than the department, than the Wolf administration and the Department of Revenues. IFO uh, projects a $1.5 billion surplus at the end of this fiscal year, the 2021, which ends on June 30th. Department of Revenue and, and um, the, the governor's office project a deficit of 233 million. Big discrepancy there. I, I get it. I think um, revenue though is 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 has revised their numbers a little bit. So um, we'll, we'll we'll see. I, I know who everyone's hoping is is right on this. I think one of the bigger um, concerning items with regard to the uh, report that that IFO has prepared is. The, uh, uh, the, the demographic, I'll call the Democrat, demographic crisis that Pennsylvania is facing. Um, I didn't share this slide, but 
Um, the, the independent fiscal office testified this week before the Senate uh, Appropriations Committee on their budget, and they provided a an update uh, on some of their numbers. But their democratic uh, demographic snapshot of the Commonwealth is really disconcerting. You'll be able to read, see this in our legislative update uh, this week. We'll include an attachment of. Uh, um, on their their presentation, but yeah, I know you may not be able to see this, but according to this demogra demographic snapshot, if you look at the at the age breakdowns over the next five to almost ten years, um, the only age groups that are really uh, growing in Pennsylvania are those at my age group, uh, the sixty plus age group. Most of the other age groups uh, predominantly are are in the red or are. Are declining, so I think that's that. Uh, on top of the, the the fiscal issue, I think is the uh, the structural issue is a is an incredibly uh, challenging uh, public policy issue for the General Assembly to have to address. Moving on, I uh, really want to take just uh, a couple minutes to talk about the current uh, fiscal year budget, 2021. Uh, as you probably all remember, it was it was done in two parts. Um, in in May, the uh, General Assembly passed about a twenty five billion dollar budget to basically fund everything through the end of November. It was a kind of a, a five month month budget, and then the General Assembly came back in November after the elections and right before Signe died, the end of the two thousand twenty legislative session, and passed another nine billion dollars to fund the rest of the state operation programs and services through the through November uh, June 30th and total a 24 billion dollar spending plan uh, a lot of it again was predicated on federal stimulus money 3.1 uh, billion um, uh, from the feds uh, transfers from different uh, state programs 430 and a recertification of revenues um, because of revenues coming into coming into the fiscal year from last year because of the, the pandemic and the shutdown um, no new fees or taxes. I think um, the one comment I have is how how uh, relatively easy this process was, and I, I I just I think part of it was obviously there was a great unknown, and lawmakers and need, were, were wanted to work together and just get through get through the crisis as 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 quickly as they could. Uh, to their credit, and they did. Um, but uh, again, I think this kind of sets up the, the groundwork for. The structural issues that uh, the independent fiscal office identified in their five-year budget outlook. Again, a lot of reliance on one-time revenue sources uh, that likely will not be there uh, moving forward in, in the future years. Um, I mentioned the the projections that IFO and and the, and the state have on revenue sources. Uh, I think obviously what's going to help um, again this particularly this fiscal year. Uh, or um, more likely next fiscal year is that we just passed a federal, um, not even sure what the, what the title of it is, but the federal stimulus bill that just passed yesterday that President uh, Biden is likely to sign. That will uh, mean another $13 billion coming to Pennsylvania, uh, a little over seven seven point three billion coming to the Commonwealth, coming right to state government, and another five point seven billion coming to uh, local government. So certainly that will help. Uh, but again, the reliance on one-time revenue sources is is current, certainly a, a budgetary a budgetary problem long term. So Governor Wolf presented his 2021-22 uh, budget, his seventh, uh, and uh, next obviously next to last budget uh, in early February. It's a 37.8. Uh, $37.9 billion spending plan that invest in public education, uh, workforce initiatives, um, and also economic development. You can see some of the other supports, vulnerable populations, increased capacity to fight COVID-19, uh, and proposes uh, significant tax and revenue modifications, which we will um, certainly talk about um, in, a, in a few minutes. It's a uh, 3 point Eight billion dollar increase over 2021, around 11 percent increase. Um, this is budget proposals. I think a little bit more reminiscent of what Governor Wolf proposed with his first budget on 2015. A little more, more um, aggressive, uh, more progressive, and not not my words, the governor's words. More progress, more progressive, particularly in the area of, of the tax code. Um, if you look at if you if you look at the but any the, the detail and budget though 
it says it's a 37, $38 billion spending plan. But when you factor in uh, some of the other programs, uh, particularly um, with regard to human services, you add that into the mix, um, it's closer to a, a actually a 40 or $41 uh, billion spending plan. Like to show just a couple of charts here. Uh, while the $37 billion general fund budget is, is you know, what the, the focus on, the total operating budget is upwards of, of $96, $97 billion now, Pennsylvania's operating, total operating budget with all the other uh, license uh, funds and, and, and motor license funds. You can combine those. Looking at uh, the expenditures part, um, or the, the, the revenue sources, PIT, personal income tax, and sales and use tax are still uh, the, the, the two behemoths. Uh, almost 80% of revenues come um, to fund the general fund come from those two items. Corporate tax seems to have been holding its own at 9% over the, over the course of uh, a number of years. And expenditures, where where the uh, proposed funding is going. So you can see health and human services and education are over 80% of the budget. Um, and how human services, the human services side of it is really what the area that is the, the General Assembly and, and the administration have, tr have trouble really uh, getting their, their hands around it and, and getting a hold of it from a spending standpoint. Um, I'm always a little nervous as a non-CPA to talk uh, uh, to run through a financial statement with a number of uh, of accountants, but I'm going to give it a try. You can see here. Hopefully, you can see that a little bit better than I can. So you can see the numbers um, again on the the 1920. Uh, we ended with a um, a 2.7 billion dollar deficit. A lot of that was uh, obviously moving the due dates from April into into um, into the the 21 22 uh, due date into July last year, uh, but you can see the uh, the support that's coming from the federal government, uh, in particular the FMAP, which is the Federal Medical Assistance Medical Assistance Percentage um, Program that funds that helps funds fund the state's medical assistance, which is our Medicaid program. Uh, and then you uh, you can see the deficit uh, projected at two hundred thirty three million dollars for the uh, for the fiscal year. And revenue sources, um, you can see a, a pretty healthy proposed increase in revenues um, over uh, uh, over the year, six point five percent. And obviously, with the, the stimulus pro, uh, package coming uh, from Congress uh, last night, that flowing through unemployment comp checks and and what have you, um, this obviously bodes well for the the turning the economy around, uh, not only here but uh, nationally as well. Um, investment in education. This has been a cornerstone of every uh, Tom Wolf budget. There's no surprise here. Um, the, the first item, the increase in bas basic education funding of $1.35 billion. I put that, if, if you have to prioritize um, a, a couple of items in the governor's budget, I would put this as 1A um, as a priority only because of one being you need the, uh, the, the personal income tax change, obviously, to fund uh, 1A. But this is this increase is predicated on a, uh, uh, a significant personal income tax increase, which I'll, I'll talk about uh, shortly. But it also is a policy decision by the administration to drive out more of the best basic education funding uh, monies through the FAIR funding formula, which was enacted by the General Assembly in, in 2016. And this FAIR funding formula is more equitable, uh, and it's determine, it, it, determining a district share of state dollars uh, on factors such as enrollment, uh, students learning English, um, experience in poverty, poverty, and the median median uh, income for the district. Right now, only new dollars, uh, meaning dollars after a basic education dollars, uh, 
added to the system after 2016 are funded through this basic education, the new fair funding formula. It's about 11% of the 6.8 billion that was uh, allocated in the current fiscal year. The governor is making an effort uh, through this to uh, drive more dollars, more significant dollars out through the fair funding formula is basically what he's trying to do here. Um, other areas, $200 million increase uh, in invest to invest in student achievement, $200 million more, in, uh, $200 million increase in special education funding, $25 million increase in pre-K counts and $5 million increase in Head Start. Also a $199 million for a Nellie Bly tuition program and uh, talking about uh, using uh, other other sources. This is uh, funds from, uh, he's transferring, proposing to transfer money from the Horseman's Fund to fund this uh, tuition program. Governor also uh, proposes inc uh, funding uh, PSERS, the Public School Employees Retirement System, at the actuary re required contribution level. Uh, this year, it's $2.73 billion. That's a 1.2% increase over the current 2021 fiscal year. That's probably one of the lowest increases that we've had in a number of years. Governor is also proposing a $45 million teacher salary uh, and also uh, uh, charter school reforms. Um, one of the reforms governor is proposing is to apply the special education funding formula to, to charter schools. Um, and also uh, proposing changes to the educational improvement and opportunity scholarship tax credit programs. I know those are those are very popular programs. It lowers the maximum administrative set aside from 20% to 5%. This the, the administration believes will free up about $36 million. Uh, and there's also enhanced reporting requirements on student, students, families, and educational outcomes. The next slide uh, we're going to show um, is the pre the pre K uh, to 12 education funding over the course of the last year. That first bar graph uh, is the last year of the of the Corbett administration. You can see. Um, Again, governor's proposing a total of about $11.2 billion. Again, uh, governor really is trying, is emphasizing driving out uh, these dollars to particularly the basic education funding through the fair funding formula, moving that 11% of the 6.7, $6.8 billion uh, to a significantly lower the ratio from about 11% to the 90%, uh, 11% and 90%. Uh, of monies being driven out for uh, through the fair funding formula. Economic development initiatives, again, are, are key to uh, uh, governor's budget proposal. Um, one of the, the, the major areas is, uh, once again, governor's calling for an increase in the state minimum wage to $15 an hour. It's currently uh, $7.50 an hour. That would increase over a number of years, um, jump to $12 an hour on January 1, and increase 50% every year until it reaches, uh, um, reaches $15. There does seem to be, I know there was uh, an effort at the national level, there does seem to be some compromise area um, with, um, with, within, within the General Assembly. Um, the Senate, I believe last year or the year before, they all seem to run together now, but there was a bipartisan a minimum wage increase passed by the state Senate um, within the last year or so that uh, did not make any headway in the House but there at least seems to be um, some area for potential compromise there. And then you can see some of the other program areas, just, just kind of highlighting some of the, the major program areas, uh, funding particularly for uh, just expanded broadband, particularly in rural areas, uh, and investing in distressed municipalities, just uh, two areas to call to, call to your attention. I mentioned earlier um, the difficulty with the human services budget, um, which is is constantly running over what uh, the General Assembly and the, the administration allot for the for the fiscal year. Again, in the current fiscal year, they're already projecting a nine hundred million dollar deficit in this area, and the administration is asking for a a supplemental in the twenty one twenty two budget of nine hundred million dollars. This is this is clearly a cost driver 
uh, it's 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 a challenge uh, for any administration and general assembly to kind of get their their arms around this uh, this uh, this this budget area. As you can see, it's it's now a uh, little over fourteen billion dollars uh, uh, budget area and, and keeps growing every year. And again, you can see there some of the highlights: uh, one million dollars to expand legal services to low-income individuals and family, uh, one million dollars to develop and provide comprehensive direct care worker training in the participant direct model program and a couple of other areas. Highlights from the human services budget. <clears throat> Let's talk about the proposal, proposed tax increases. Again, probably the most aggressive um, tax proposals we have seen in, in quite some time. Um, you recall the Governor Wolf's first budget in, in 2015, he did propose a, a, a a personal income tax increase at the time, and that was just a uh, an increase from 3.07, I think, to 3.7, uh, right around there. And you can recall um, uh, the uh, the firestorm that that set off. But it's proposing a, a a twist to the to that plan, a pretty significant twist. And as I said earlier, I, I see this as being the uh, pri priority, if you will, for the administration to be able to really fund their their education package. Um, and I'll take the first two together since they're, they are tied together. Governor's proposing an increase in the personal income tax, a 46% increase from 3.07 to 4.49% effective uh, Jan July 1 of 2021. This would generate about $3 billion in, in net new revenues. Um, and again, to my previous slide, about $1.5 billion will be driven out to uh, to uh, education funding, 1.35 basic education. The other funding, um, increased funding form from the PIT increase would go to uh, fund state operation and help close the, uh, the, the structural deficit. This is tied with an expansion of the tax forgiveness program. The current limits, as you can see there, single filer are $6,500 for a, a married couple, $13,000 with an additional 9,500 Per each uh, for each independent. There's also a phase out um, a phase out that um, a, a, a component to this that uh, is a 10% decrease in forgiveness for every additional $250 that's currently in the law. Governor is proposing uh, new increases, new limits: $15,000 for single filers and $30,000 for mar for uh, married couples or. or, or for, for married filing jointly with an additional $10,000 for each independent, uh, for each dependent, pardon me. Uh, the proposal also that uh, that phase out would uh, lower to 1% decrease in, in tax forgiveness for every $500. Uh, those limits, the 6,500 and the 13,000 have not been increased since 2003, 2004. So they are they are ripe for uh, for an increase. So what the governor is proposing is uh, to a family of four right now under the current program would pay would owe no taxes. Um, a family of four would owe no up taxes up to thirty two thousand dollars of income. Uh, it would phase out uh, slowly up to thirty four point two uh, thirty four thousand two hundred fifty dollars. Again, that's current. What the governor is proposing now is to increase that level. So a family of four would pay no taxes up to fifty thousand dollars and would phase out uh, between fifty or or um, increase or or not increase, but would extend the phase out range. That's what I'm trying to say for tax forgiveness for a family of four between fifty and ninety five thousand. So that's kind of the the range. Nothing up to fifty thousand and pay a little bit more up to ninety five thousand. Um, the next chart probably uh, shows this much better than I just explained it, as you can see there. Um, I, I'm, I wouldn't spend a lot of time on this. Uh, the legislators we have talked to, both Democrat and Republican, feel that the, the proposal is, is, is dead in the water. I do think, however, that you could see uh, some uh, reshuffling of the, 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 the limits uh, the income limits, the ones that I mentioned before, 6,500 for individual and 13,000 for uh, a married couple. I think you could see changes uh, to, to those areas, but the entire um, expansion and making the tax system more progressive, as the governor has noted, is probably is probably a non a non-starter at this point. 
but it's it's worth the effort, quite frankly. I guess the question is the timing of it probably um, isn't the best. Uh, you would think uh, the timing would have been better, quite frankly, two years ago, coming off of a huge re-election effort um, and margins in the House and Senate were uh, much, much narrower at the time, meaning he had more Democratic votes. Um, this just seems to be a little bit uh, misguided, um, to be to be honest. Moving ahead, uh, combined reporting uh, again. Uh, I think this is probably the sixth or seventh, I'll just say the seventh time this has been proposed. This goes back to uh, the Rendell days, combined reporting, essentially where Pennsylvania is currently a, a separate company filing state, except for companies file their own returns, combined states where companies combine overall income and expenses um, and then a portion uh, a percentage to, to, to Pennsylvania. My non-CPA uh, uh, definition of combined reporting. You can see there uh, combined reporting uh, offset uh, decreases in the corporate net income tax, which is one of the highest in, in the country. With regard to, to combined reporting itself, uh, PICPA has a position paper on combined reporting. We are neutral. There are winners and losers, uh, and we feel our role is more of a, a technical advisor. Um, two more uh, tax proposals, a legalization of adult use cannabis. Um, not new. Pennsylvania is, is, is jumping on this bandwagon. Um, governor, however, wants to use as a different somewhat different twist, wants to use uh, revenues from uh, from legalizing uh, marijuana to support historically disadvantaged uh, small businesses uh, and support uh, restor restorative uh, criminal justice programs. Virginia recently, Virginia recently enacted um, this similar legislation. It's the 16th state. A lot of pressure um, to, to do something in this area. I, I just don't think the, the votes, quite frankly, are there at this point. Uh, same with the severance tax on natural gas. Again, nothing new. I, I should clarify, this is not technically part of the governor's budget. It is kind of hanging out there as uh, a, a, a hanger on in the budget. Certainly the administration would like to see this enacted, particularly to help um, fund some of its workforce development programs. But um, it's part of uh, governor's back to work PA initiative, which is renamed uh, was the Restore PA program. So severance tax, again, um, long shot, quite frankly, at this point. Uh, a, a, a bit of good news. Hopefully all of you are aware of Act 1 of 2021, uh, which we PICPA was able to uh, secure passage of the PPP loan forgiveness language. Um, this is legislation that was dealing, that was setting up um, uh, was a COVID-19 relief package. Um, it was it concludes, as you can see there, 219, 212 million dollars in COVID relief to restaurants, uh, uh, educational programs, and, and for rental assistance. Uh, we were able, working with our allies, uh, Representative George Dunbar, uh, Representative our, our CPA uh, caucus, if you will, to get an amendment as the bill was moving through the House to secure. Uh, um, uh, the PPP loans are not taxable in Pennsylvania. It's very similar to the legislation uh, Representative George Dunbar sponsored last session. Um, and this session, you can see their House Bill 385. It also exempts stimulus payments from state income tax, kind of window dressing since revenues already said they're, they're exempt. You can see, uh, again, uh, this map from the Tax Foundation that shows states that have enacted PPP loan forgiveness at the state level. We're proud of that and we'd just like to thank everyone who made that happen. I really think the the effort by the by members at the grassroots and it's something that we were pounding at here in Pennsylvania, uh, I mean, in Harrisburg for months. We had legislation last year, House Bill 2497, again, Representative Dunbar's bill, uh, pass the House through the Senate Finance Committee uh, and poised for a vote, and we just ran out of time. So it's something that we had been working on for quite some time, and uh, just a uh, just a confluence of a perfect a perfect storm, if you will, to get it to the governor's desk uh, as part of Act One of 2021. As I mentioned at the start, um, not a lot of tax legislation has been introduced and moving. Um, the, the one tax bill, um, the Senate Bill 109 that I just talked about was not a tax code bill, it was a fiscal code bill. 
Um, the only other tax code bill that I think is out there is Representative George Dunbar's 385, um, which had was a standalone PPP loan forgiveness. We were moving that, assuming that we were not going to have um, not going to have the, uh, the another vehicle to come around. So uh, that's the only other uh, tax bill that's really out there right now. Some of the other legislation that's that's on our radar, you can see Representative Don Kiefer has House Bill 73 that would eliminate the sale or transfer of certain ent entertainment type credits, uh, film, video game, and concert rehearsal. It's in the Finance Committee. Uh, Representative Grind uh, Keith Greiner has uh, introduced legislation on behalf of the uh, PICPA that will change the corporate tax uh, due date from 30 days after the due date of the federal return to the 15th day, 15th day of the month following the federal due date. This creates a little bit more predictability uh, and certainty in, in the process. Um, so we're, we're uh, confident that we can get some, some traction on that. Representative George Dunbar has a couple of bills in. Uh, House Bill 198 dealing with um, a temporary uh, lifting of the cap of, of NOLs for 2021. Um, uh, that seems to be gaining some traction and some interest. He also has one, House Bill 199 um, that will allow for cost and or uh, percentage depreciation of mines, oil and gas wells and other uh, natural uh, deposits. Um, this would uh, bring Pennsylvania law in this area into conformity with uh, federal law. And a couple of small business reform bills, again, have not been, I think, officially uh, introduced yet, but they're, but they're out there. Um, there's another bill, House Bill 732, sponsored by Representative Mike, Representative Mike Jones, a Republican from New York, and Pete Schweier, Democrat from the uh, Allentown area, uh, that removes the 20-year cap on net operating loss carry forward. So that's out there gaining some traction, gaining some interest. Um, moving ahead to local tax legislation, just a couple of bills. Uh, one uh, dealing with the Sterling Act, Representatives uh, Ferry and Thomas from Bucks County have introduced this that would require the city of Philadelphia to reimburse surrounding jurisdictions uh, that impose the, the, the local EIT. Uh, it seems to be a pretty huge lift, but it's out there. And Representative Martina White has reintroduced her Philadelphia net operating loss bill, House Bill 324. She had legislation last session that made it uh, nearly through the governor's desk, but just died again. Um, time ran out and General Assembly, uh, she has to reintroduce the bill. Um, we're still looking for, uh, we haven't seen it yet. Senator Brown has introduced his, uh, has not introduced his local uh, tax con consolidated consolidation legislation, which would allow collectors to collect EIT, uh, business privilege tax and LST. That's something that uh, we're, we're monitoring. Um, licensing legislation, PICPA is going to uh, tee up uh, some amendments to our CPA law. It's going to be sponsored by Representative Keith Greiner. Representative Greiner also has another bill, House Bill 325, that would allow licensing boards, the State Board of Accountancy and the other 20 plus licensing boards to provide advisory opinions, non-binding, non-legal advisory opinions to licensees. This is House Bill 325 and it's scheduled for a vote in the House Licensure Committee uh, next week. And we're uh, cautiously optimistic that we can get, uh, um, get that through the House and we'll work in the Senate to get it passed. And the CPA pro bono legislation is back, um, just for your for your information, legislation that would allow CPAs to do uh, work for volunteer fire companies and offset with uh, uh, a decrease in CPE and a, a decrease in license fee. On the horizon, real quickly, um, congressional and state reapportionment, this is the next huge issue that the General Assembly budget uh, reapportionment uh, that, uh, where the state every 10 years has to divvy up not only the congressional seats, uh, but their state, House and Senate seats. The congressional process is simply through legislation. Um, the, the state process where the House, state House and Senate are divided, that is a five person commission. Problem is that uh, the census data that they expected earlier this year is likely not going to arrive until late this year and possibly even early 2022, which creates certainly creates election problems because 2022 state elections are supposed to be off the new map. So I know in other states, they've already uh, pushed back election dates for next year. 
I wouldn't be surprised to see Pennsylvania push election dates back as well to, to 2022. Our fiscal responsibility task force um, met again this year and we provided a pretty comprehensive report. It was the uh, uh, focus of a public hearing this week before the, the tax modernization and reform subcommittee of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives that, that uh, report is on our website. It discusses uh, major tax areas and, and provides a commentary and analysis of those areas. Also proposes some streamlining and efficiencies, efficiencies um, in both the Department of Human Services and uh, Department of, of uh, Pennsylvania Department of Education. Um, PICPA is a member of the Financial Explo Exploitation of Older Adults Task Force that's uh, convened by the uh, Department of Aging. And this uh, task force is, um, its mission is to identify and assess barriers, opportunities, and potential solutions uh, to mitigate or eliminate financial explo exploitation of older adults. The task force has been meeting for several months uh, and will be uh, at some point releasing a report uh, with a series of, of legislative um, uh, legislative recommendations. Civil justice reform, the PICPA is a member of the Pennsylvania Civil Justice Reform Coalition. It's seeking legislation, limited uh, temporary liability protection for businesses that comply with CDC guidelines uh, in their ability to open and, and not face uh, not face lawsuits. Uh, legislation was passed last year that made it to the governor's desk, uh, but he unfortunately vetoed it. Uh, Senator Lisa Baker has reintroduced her, that legislation um, and um, we'll begin have to begin the process all over again. Auto IRA, some of you may have heard us talk about auto IRAs in, in the past. Um, this is an initiative that uh, former treasurer Joe Torsella identified. Um, he had a, a working group, a task force looking at uh, retirement in Pennsylvania. Uh, PICPA was a member, Bob Jeswinski, a past president, uh, was a member of that task force and he came up with a number of recommendations. One is uh, requiring uh, auto employers to offer uh, um, IRAs to their employees. This was a uh, Torsella initiative. New treasurer, Republican Stacey Garrity, has adopted it and has made it her priority. It's kind of a interesting twist between Republicans and Democrats and Republicans, but it's a it's a um, it, it's it's an interesting initiative, and I think something you're going to uh, hear more about in the in the coming weeks. You go to the ballot um, when you go to the polls on May 18th. You'll have uh, at least two ballot questions to. Uh, to look through and approve or disapprove as you see fit. And these are really to address the governor's, uh, the governor's authority in, in, uh, in these uh, to extend emergency, uh, emergency dis disaster declarations. It's an issue that the general, Republicans of General Assembly have been fighting with the, with Governor Wolf since March of last year. Um, other states have gone this route too, to try to, um, uh, roll back some of the authority, uh, that the, the governors have, I think, uh, New York was recently one that enacted some uh, some changes in this area as well. So again, there may be there may be one or two other ballot initiatives, but these are the first two we know for sure. And winding down here real quickly, Department of Revenue, uh, just a couple initiatives I want to point out to you. Uh, if you haven't looked at my path, um, I would encourage you to take take a moment to take uh, to to look at that. Uh, we have a, a pretty comprehensive video session on our website as, all, as well as a user guide to help you walk uh, walk through that process. It's very helpful and I know the Department of Revenue is, is really, really pushing for practitioners to use my path. The P10, now the uh, prepared tax identification number is now required on the PA40s. You probably all know that. Uh, shout out to John Kaschek, PICPA member and also Department of Revenue's uh, Executive Deputy Secretary on his election as president of, of NASTOA, which is the Northeast States Tax Officials Association. Uh, congrats to John on that. Uh, the Department of Revenue also has a, uh, uh, is pushing the voluntary disclosure program. The Department of Revenue is offering a 90 day uh, voluntary compliance program for any business that has inventory or stores property in Pennsylvania, but is not registered to collect and pay uh, Pennsylvania taxes. The program runs through uh, May 8th of 2021. Uh, two recent um, uh, bulletins from the Department of Revenue. 
Um, the restricted tax credit bulletin 20, uh, 2021-01 uh, discusses both EIT, the Educational Improvement Tax Credit Program, and the Opportunity Scholarship Program. And just yesterday, the department issued guidance on home office expenses during telecommuting. Um, haven't had a chance to review that yet, but it's on our website, and it's something that you can uh, you can you can access from the website. And the last slide I think we should have should have had under the PPP discussion, I apologize, but some additional clarification from the Department of Revenue with regard to uh, S Corps and, and applying and how to apply the uh, uh, PPP loans. Again, this is on our website, but you have it here. With that, um, I, I'm going to just check to see if there are any questions. Look quickly. Um, Yes, um, someone just mentioned that uh, there is um, a lot of non-logged in functionality on my path um, that, that you don't have to be logged in, but there's a lot of a lot of things you can do on my path without having to be logged in. Um, sorry, let me just. Is uh, tax forgiveness the same as personal exemption on the federal level? Uh, John, I, 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 I don't believe it is, but let me get you. Uh, let me make sure for that. As non non practitioner, I, I, I don't want to give you the wrong answer, but we'll follow up with you. Uh, Elizabeth Boyle, uh, why is it non taxable income considered in tax forgiveness calculation? Uh, taxpayers with large pensions, um, large pensions, uh, for instance pay no uh, PA taxes on interest and dividends under the calculation. You're absolutely right, Elizabeth. That is, in fact, that is something that we mentioned to um, uh, to House lawmakers earlier this year. I, I failed to mention uh, Jason Screenack, who is a member of our state tax committee, provided testimony to the House Majority Policy Committee uh, early year this month. Um, and one of the issues that he talked about was um, the uh, this area of tax forgiveness that uh, is overly perhaps overly beneficial for some taxpayers. So we put that on the on the equation on the table for lawmakers to consider. Given the demographics of the Commonwealth, has any consideration be given to give be given to uh, begin taxing Social Security? No, <laughs> Jared. Uh, Representative Frank Ryan proposed that last year. It did not go over very well. Um, politically, it's just, it, it's a really, really tough issue. Michelle Cooper, how likely uh, do you think it would be to full PIT increase from three point? Um, I, I would say, quite frankly, very unlikely. Um, I think you could see, as I mentioned earlier, um, a tweaking of the, tax forgiveness levels the 6500 and the 13000 for a married couple i think you could see some some movement there uh i i just don't see uh not not to never say never uh but surely not to 4.49% increase i just uh, not in this lifetime that's my unofficial position Uh, I think that's all my questions, um, or all the questions that I see. Again, I, I will follow up with um, I will follow up with you, uh, John, with your question. Um, uh, but with that, you, you see where. Uh, also, I just real quickly give you my email address, and that is p c a l c a r a at p i c p a dot o r g. Um, feel free to, to email me anytime. Uh, we'll, we'll certainly get back to you. Again, want to thank you. Hope you uh, found the last 50 minutes or so informative. Um, if uh, you'll be receiving a, a survey questionnaire, please uh, fill that out and send it back. It helps us. Um, it helps us, um, you know, put these programs on and and, and make adjustments uh, so that you're you find them helpful. With that, David. Uh, and everyone, thank you. Have a great rest of your Thursday and a great weekend. And don't forget to set your clocks forward this weekend. Have a great day.